Well, I don't know what Megan has been saying about me, so um, <laughs> I hope it was all right. <laughs> um, thanks for coming to, um, to hear me talking about what I thought I'd talk about central banking boundaries and with the, inspired by the following uh, question. Now that banking supervision, uh, as well as monetary policy, is operating out of Frankfurt, and that is the new headquarters of the ECB, which will be opened in, in a couple of months. Uh, what will the Central Bank of Ireland be doing? Is there anything left for the Central Bank of Ireland to do? So that's what I wanted to talk to you about, if you don't mind. And uh, of course, since we didn't change our mission statement, that's what we will be doing. But I'd like to elaborate a little bit on that and, um, and talk about the many varied things that are still pretty important uh, for us to get right. Of course, the euro is still there and we do still have a function, myself and the staff of the central bank, uh, getting the euro area inflation rate back up to 2%, which is the medium term target of the, of the ECB, is actually quite a te technically difficult challenge now. Given that interest rates are already as low as they can go, ECB has, like the Fed and the Bank of England and Bank of Japan, been doing some unusual things. Um, and especially in the European context, doing these unusual things have some hidden shoals and sharks, quicksands. And so we, we tried to bring a distinctive flavor to this discussion from Dublin. Um, it, is an, it is an interesting business. You could spend your whole life just doing interest rate policy, monetary policy, there's the track of, of interest rates and the policy rate, the ECB policy rate in blue since the, since the euro began. And um, you can see that after a long period of reasonably sensible interest rates, moving up apparently very sensibly before, uh, as before inflation rose, possibly choking off higher inflation before the, the bust. Then subsequently the rate has, of policy rate has been brought down to 1%. For a long time, 1%. Little blip in, in 2011, which we could spend a lot of time talking about. And now down to 0.05%. Actually, when the policy rate was 1% during the period 2009, uh, for most of the period 2009, actually other instruments were being used by the central bank, the European Central Bank, to bring the money market rates down much closer to zero than to 1%. Uh, but I just put, up, put that slide up. I have a, a few um, uh, slides that I will put up and not really fully elaborate on just to tell you that we could spend uh, half a dozen lectures talking about different aspects. So the Euro monetary policy is in Frankfurt, but we do involve ourselves in the deci decisions and the discussions around monetary policy and into the debate. And that's been, of course, the, the situation since the start of the euro. But now there's something new, which is the single supervisory mechanism, banking supervision being taken over uh, in, in, to, to an extent by Frankfurt. Ensuring that the Irish banks could stay open and provide the essential functions and short-term pay payments functions, short-term credit functions, while they undertook running repairs has been a big task for us at the central bank over the past number of years. They needed to reassess their entire risk management functions. And our role as prudential supervisor has been to assess and challenge their effectiveness in doing that. In addition to the standard supervisory practice that everybody around the world applies, we felt the need to improvise additional intrusive engagements with the banks to try to accelerate and improve the speed with which they've been processing and dealing with a very large percentage of their loan portfolio, which is still not fully performing, even after the six years of crisis and after the forced sale to NAMA of about 70 billions of their large property loans. So all that now is passing to Frankfurt. Job of supervising the main banks from a prudential point of view 
passes to the Frankfurt-based single supervisory mechanism. Following the completion later this month of the comprehensive <coughs> assessment of capital adequacy of the banks, which is the entry ticket. Um, and actually the way the comprehensive assessment is being operated illustrates the future continuing role in prudential supervision of the central bank and its relationship with the single supervisory mechanism. Because the design and rules of the comprehensive assessment have been decided in Frankfurt, but most of the operation of the, of the assessment, the bulk of the detailed work, has been managed in the national capitals and managed here. Um, so there's a sort of rules that were uh, just just a nice table that I thought you might like to see uh, as a kind of backdrop to this stress test thing. I'm not going to talk about the stress test, but there you are. There's a 2011 stress stress test. We had an adverse case, and we said, what would happen to the banks if uh, house prices and lots of other things as well? But house prices is the most important indicator. Uh, I'll just show you house prices. What would happen if they fell by 17.4% in 2011, 18.8% in 2012, and then sort of stabilized again in, in 2013? So I put that up to compare it with actual prices. Actual prices fell 13%, 13.2% in, in 2011, 13 again in 2012, and then they started turning around, 1.4 in 2013, and this year 10.3 so far. Now, what does the stress test of the ECB ask, it says what will happen, it has a base case which is a sort of expected case if you like, and a stress case. And you can see that already, well just look at the stress case, it's projecting, st these stress uh, case parameters were decided much earlier this year and they projected uh, minus 3.5 house prices in 2014 another fall in 2015 and just a small stabilization in 2016. So you can see that's a quite a severe stress on, on house prices. But anyway, those were decided in Frankfurt and then we churn through and work with the banks to churn through uh, all, all of the information in their books to, to come up with an estimate of, uh, of capital adequacy. Um, this pattern of most of the prudential supervision work being done in Ireland and most of the final decisions in Frankfurt is, is how things are going to be right into the future. The single supervisory mechanism starts on November the 4th, so all the power is going to uh, Frankfurt for the main banks. There will also be some changes in the way we approach prudential supervision of banks in practice as we learn lessons from the past five years, and also as we adapt to the supervisory manual that has been adopted by the SSM and which draws on practices, the best practices, from each of the existing supervisors around Europe. So we'll do it in a slightly different way. Is it going to be better? Well, everybody thinks their system is better, but anyway, I can say that Irish contributions to the system as a whole will continue. And indeed, we actually provided the software which the ECB are now using for well, they may obviously will develop it a lot over the coming period, but they're starting with our software, which was developed for the central bank in the last three years. And I just put up a screenshot. Um, the uh, supervisors were very alarmed to hear that I was going to put up a screenshot of the internal... Uh, <laughs> so they said, Bank X, we'll call it Bank X. So it's, uh, everything has been... Um, so this, this is a real bank, actually. They just changed the name to X or XX, XYZ <laughs> Bank. And that was the assessment on the 24th of July at 11.07 a.m. So that particular bank was estimated to have a uh, low insurance risk, uh, medium-high liquidity risk, and so on. And, and uh, there are pages and pages of, of information brought into, uh, typed in for the, this bank, uh, prompting the supervisor Make sure you check this, make sure you check that, make sure it adds up to your assessment of risk in different dimensions. And then, of course, there can be uh, cross-cutting comparisons between banks. So I, anyway, I just show you that there, there, our system was, actually, we sold it to the ECB to, to, to get them started with. Um, so it indicates the fact that we will, as with monetary policy, make, the in, make our input. We are doing that right away. And of course, there's another uh, but the ECB would be in charge. 
and they'd have supervisory teams, somebody from Frankfurt would be in charge of supervisory teams, then our people, Dublin-based, would be on the teams and they'll be in regular communication. And smaller banks would continue to be supervised wholly from Dublin within an overall uh, SSM approach, as will, for example, the 400 credit unions in Ireland. They're supervised just from Dublin. And some of those obviously continue to need special attention. So that for the supervision of banks, but there's another function which remains more or less wholly, I won't say wholly, but largely Dublin-based, and that is financial stability of the system, the Irish financial system as a whole. So it is, remains a national responsibility. Bubbles and other sources of financial instability obviously can emerge in national economies, even if, some, if everything is generally stable in the rest of the Union. So, uh, so we have to be ready to do things to preserve financial stability in Ireland, even if there's no need felt for any special measures to stabilize the European financial system. And we can't, for example, use interest rate policy in Ireland. We can't say, well, you know, we need to have a higher interest rate, something to, to stop, because we have a common interest rate, because we have a single currency. <coughs> so it's not a, not, that's not a tool available to, to uh, for example, stop an asset price bubble if one, if one uh, took hold. So actually, there's an emerging academic consensus among people interested in central banking, even outside the context of monetary union, that asset price bubbles and surges in general consumer price inflation should be treated with different instruments. Uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, this very, very hot debate, uh, the US, worldwide, consumer price inflation is low, but asset price inflation is high. So should you, leave, uh, sh should you raise interest rates to choke off the asset price inflation when you already have low consumer price inflation? So this was a uh, discussed at great length in many conferences. And, uh, and the conclusion was, actually, it's probably better to leave interest rates for general consumer price inflation and use other instruments for asset price uh, bubbles. Some people. Some people argue that you shouldn't do anything about asset price bubbles, just let them burst. But I think after our experience in 2008, uh, very few people adhere to that point of view. They feel that the bursting bubble is a very damaging thing. So you should use one or more macro prudential tools. So what are they like? Range of instruments. Uh, some of them outside the toolbox of the central bank. So there are lots of things that you can do to, to, um, uh, to stop an asset price bubble, tax policy, um, well, there's just a lot of things that haven't anything to do with the central bank, but the central bank has tools and the central bank of Ireland is designated uh, by, uh, by the Irish government as the macro prudential, uh, the financial stability person, the entity responsible for financial stability. So what can we do? Capital adequacy surcharges. We're allowed to do that, but we have to consult with Europe and so forth. But you can do have capital adequacy surcharges. Uh, Overall, or for different uh, sectoral lending, you can have loan-to-value ratio ceilings on loan-to-value. You can have caps on loan-to-income ratios for residential mortgages. Now, those last two instruments, they're not governed by EU law at all. So you, this is entirely a national responsibility. Of course, you have some, some uh, obligation to inform in advance uh, people in uh, other authorities in Europe if you're going to do one of these things but it's a national responsibility. And actually, if you think about it, in de decades gone by, those of you who look at economic history, Irish lenders, actually, way back in the 60s and 70s, building societies were the big lenders, and they followed kind of mechanical rules on loan-to-value ratios uh, and multiples of income at which they would lend to uh, residential borrowers, which seemed to keep them out of trouble. Now, such ratio is pretty crude. The borrower's income can change. Say, oh, I lent to him only three and a half times his income, but the next day he lost his job. Um, loan to value ceiling, well, it doesn't constrain as much the higher the level of the property uh, purchase price. So you say, well, we're going to limit them to 80% loan to value ratio. So, uh, yeah, but if the house is worth a million, you're, that allows you, allows you to lend 800,000. So, so it, it, it's, they're, they're very crude measures. 
But given how badly banks misjudged risk management in the boom of the 2000-2008, a rule, having a rule constrain, constraining loan-to-value uh, and loan-to-income could help. I have another slide here. Let me see what it says. Oh, that's the one I saw. Let's go. There we are. This is an interesting chart. It's actually only one of many. This is, looks at the loans that are still outstanding today. And it looks at the year which the loan was originated. And it says, how many of those loans were above 90%? How many loans were above 80 to 90? Actually, probably some of the low to, loan to value ratio loans from earlier periods are already repaid by now. So this is probably uh, gives you a, an exaggerated impression about how many were above these ceilings. So it relatively small, and then it went up and qu quite high there in 2005-2007. O over 50% of loans were being issued at, at, um, at, more than, uh, at more than 80% in 2006-2007. And it hasn't come down all that much, actually. The very highest ones have come down, but they're still making loans at relatively high loan-to-value ratios. Though some of these would be loans that are, you transfer the loan from a house that already is a fairly, maybe you're in negative equity and so on, you transfer that loan to another property. <coughs> what happens to defaults? Well, there's a kind of heat map. There's, um, you can't read that. I tried to make it visible, but then I didn't have time to get somebody to redraw it. So that, but these are 68, 83% loan to value, and up here, loan to income. Uh, you see the mid halfway up is three, around three uh, times income. And the heat tells you whether these are being defaulted. So let me go zoom in on the right hand side. One of the first time bu buyers, and the other one is non first time buyers. Um, yeah, you can see that a, a bit better. And you can see that, as you would expect, loans that have been made at very high initial uh, multiple of income and loans that were made at very high initial loan to value, they're the ones that are, above all, getting into a default situation. So it's clear that those indicators are useful to... Uh, I'm sure all those people in the red box at the top are saying, I wish I'd never got that loan. And the banks are saying, oh, I wish I'd never given that loan. So there is some um, merit in this. I'm just showing you some pictures of that. We've done uh, quite a bit of analysis on, on our own data. And there's a lot of analysis done in other countries <coughs> as well. So even, even without a credit-driven bubble, it, there's much to be said for bringing back some overall rules of this type and limiting the share of mortgage lending that's at high loan-to-value and loan-to-income rates. Now that the, especially now that the property market has stopped falling and has indeed turned around with a, a bit of a bang in Dublin. So we've been talking about this uh, publicly for a while and we've been working on developing appropriate measures so it's no secret to tell you that we're going to, uh, to announce tomorrow our intention to introduce some measures. We'll launch a consultation process. It's going to be uh, uh, a, a paper produced tomorrow along those lines. So that's one thing. That's an important thing that we, can, we still do, still national responsibility. Another task which has not migrated to the single supervisory mechanism is consumer protection. Single supervisory mechanism is only about prudential regulation, making sure the banks have enough capital to absorb risks and, uh, and, and are, are managed properly from that point of view. So consumer protection, something which we're, we need to be completely on top of because nobody in Frankfurt is looking after this. And so we continue to devote resources in this area and indeed um, uh, to the extent that some of the special prudential supervisory functions, measures that we introduced in relation to the uh, processing of mortgage arrears, we, we used some of these targets that we're using, we used prudential powers to enforce these. We said, look, um, you should be dealing with your mortgages. Two reasons. One, householders that are uh, unable to pay their mortgage, they need some treatment here. Or some people who can pay their mortgage and are not, that they need to be dealt with as well. So 
from the, from the consumer point of view, it's important, but also it's important from the bank's point of view because if there's a great uh, pall of uncertainty over how, how much you're going to recover on the mortgage book, uh, then this is not a healthy uh, situation for you to be going out into the market. So we use the prudential powers, even though we also had in the back of our mind, on the, really in the forefront of our mind also, um, the need to protect the consumer. So we need to watch that and make sure that the consumer protection function continues in this especially intrusive way for the banks. And we've actually published um, published quite a lot about uh, recently about what we've been doing. There was a letter which was sent to um, the Oireachtas Committee, which had been looking at this last week, which gives a lot of detail, which you might be interested in looking at if you're if you're concerned ab about mortgage arrears, which I think anybody interested in banking is concerned about mortgage arrears, even though it may not be in the, as high profile as it was about a year ago because progress is being made. Now, I just want to say something that we can't do, though. Some fine observers find it tempting to imagine the central bank monitoring and directing each distressed mortgage resolution on a case-by-case -case basis. That's not realistic or desirable. And it wasn't even done in the centrally planned economies of Eastern Europe former Soviet Union. I'll tell you why it's not desirable. Several related reasons. The main reason is the need to assign clear responsibilities close to where the decisions are being taken. Uh, so already, even though our regulations and our codes of conduct in general prescribe minimum quality standards for the way banks deal with their retail customers, and they don't compel or ban specific products, we often find bankers hiding between a fictitious central bank rule said to be the reason for what should be and is the bank's own responsibility. So it's very easy for banks to say, to abdicate responsibility for, for saying yes and for saying no. With their sizable staffs, the detailed knowledge they have or should have about their customer circumstances and their direct contractual involvement, the banks are the best entity's best place to design solutions for their distressed mortgage borrowers. So, um, another thing, I'll skip a little bit here, but another thing that bank people, some people think, I think central banks should be mandating specific debt relief or forgiveness for borrowers. Now, actually, this is not within the central bank's power, uh, and, and it couldn't be. In intervention into the property rights of creditors is a matter for legislation under the Constitution or government fiscal action, well, that's highly unlikely given the overall fiscal pressures. The reformed insolvency legislation is a good example of that kind of intervention. Its enactment has helped focus the minds of lenders on accelerating their realistic provision of sustainable restructurings or other arrangements for households with unaffordable debts. Previously, <coughs> The households had nowhere to go. The bankruptcy code was uh, quite dysfunctional. Now the, the customers who are not being given uh, an, uh, uh, an arrangement which is viable can go through the insolvency procedure and say, you've got to help me out here, insolvency procedure, courts, because we, um, we have not got an acceptable arrangement with the bank. Now the court the courts, when it gets to the courts, they do operate in a slow process with many lengthy adjournments, providing the banks with an additional entity that they can attach blame, but at least it is a process, it is a threat point that, that uh, is already and will, I think, increasingly induce the banks to, um, make, to, to make more speedy, sustain, sustainable solutions, really sustainable restructurings possible. So there is progress now, perceptible progress in dealing with arrears. That's undeniable. Um, there's a chart, there's nothing new in that chart. Um, you can see it, it was going up and up and up and up and up until the end of 2012. And then it was sort of steady during 2013. But now we see it actually starting to fall. I'd like to see it much faster. Persistence of chronic arrears cases inhibits the ability of the government to buy, attract buyers from the banks that have been nationalized, quite apart from the situation, the very difficult situation faced by the borrowers. And it results in higher imposed capital requirements than would otherwise be necessary. So this problem has not gone away. Now in the consumer protection area, there's another thing people would, would uh, like a central bank to do. Um, 
and that is to do something about interest rates. Not about interest rates in the international money markets, which is what we were talking about early on, but the spreads that, that banks uh, charge to borrowers over the, over the uh, wholesale rates. And it's noteworthy, actually, that the spreads on non-tracker mortgage rates have moved higher and higher. Not responding positively to the lowering of the ECB policy rate from, say, 1.5% in mid-2011 to 0.05% today. So here's a chart which... Um, actually, I don't think you've seen this chart before. And what it shows is the blue line is part of what we already saw, which is the ECB policy rate. And the two green lines show the outer limit of the range of uh, mortgage interest rates, standard variable rate mortgage interest rates, not tracker rates. Now, if you look up the standard statistical sources, uh, you will see a different rate for mortgage interest rate in Ireland. You'll see a lower rate, but that's because it includes a lot of trackers into it. But these are the standard variable rates charged by different banks. These are the outer limit, not necessarily the same bank. In fact, it's not the same bank at the outer limit on, on this, uh, throughout the period. And you can see that even as the interest rate, when the interest rate started to fall in the late 2008 and early 2009, Sure enough, the, the mortgage rates went down. But when they went down again from, from 2011, there was no response. In fact, if anything, an increase. So what are we to say about that? Now, admittedly, despite this widening of spreads on non-tracker mortgages, the banks have not been profitable. So it's not as if they're taking huge uh, profits out of this operation. And yes, probably they underpriced risk for years and years. Maybe have they started to overprice risk? That's a reasonable question. But I want to track down through this a little bit more. Ireland is not the only country that's been experiencing widening spreads. Well, here are the UK standard variable rates. Different country, different currency, but still. It's interesting. That's the red line. And you say, well, wait a minute. Coming back to 2003, the boom period, how come UK interest rates were so high? Can't understand that. Are they? And that's mostly explained by the fact that the UK policy rates, the UK bank rate, was much higher in that period. So I've, this part's getting pretty complicated now because I'm going to put in the UK bank rate as well. So as you can see, it was much higher than the blue line. The light blue line is the UK bank rate, deep blue line is ECB. So it was much higher in that earlier period. So their policy rates are close to zero now in both, in both places. And we see that the Irish standard variable rates are around the same as the UK standard variable rates. So we're not really out of line, but still. Um, here's another, I just, just taking that data and computing the spreads over the policy rate, you get this relationship, which is quite interesting. The UK spread over the policy, their policy rate and the Irish spread over ECB policy rate. So actually, there was a period, 2009, 2010, that the Irish banks did not increase their spread, but the UK banks took immediate advantage of the lowering of the policy rate. They said, Lower, policy rate is lower, but we're going to still going to continue to charge more or less the same, or we're going to charge maybe a little bit less, but not as much less as the policy rate. And now the Irish banks have caught up and maybe even going far. Now this is, raises all sorts of interesting questions. We know that it's not so easy for the ba Irish banks to fund themselves as a pol at the policy rate as maybe the UK banks can. And that's part of the story, certainly in 2011 and 2012. And it's not just mortgage interest rates. Other countries where we have, take the data on lending to business, non-financial corporations. These are all, these are four uh, Euro area countries. You can see the Ireland is in green again. It's sort of apples and oranges. These try to eliminate for differences. These are loans are up to one year. They're supposed to be comparable. But there are all sorts of small structural differences between the banking systems. But what we see is that, that uh, since the crisis, the French interest rates have drifted down and down and down. The Irish 
rates have not fallen as much as the French rates, but the Spanish and Italian rates are still higher. So this is a kind of Europe-wide change in the spreads. Some of it is obviously correct and some of it is not correct. But how much is not correct? So should there be a ceiling on, on interest spreads? I'm, I'm afraid I'm going on too long. Well, control of retail interest rates by the central bank is not provided for in legislation, and, and I think it should remain that way. And it won't come, to, come as a surprise to you people, students of economics, because you're accustomed to understanding the problems that can be caused by preventing the emergence of a market clearing price. But I think there's an important political economy dimension here as well. If the local banks are charging unnecessarily high interest rates, there will be an inducement for new lend entry into lending here. And that, reversing the trend of the past few years, would be very welcome and would have the effect of bringing both pricing and the quality of banking services to a much better place. On contrast, aggressive official interest rate spread control would be the clearest warning signal to would-be entrants that they might not be permitted to earn sufficient profits to justify the cost of entering. So I really think this is a very dangerous area to get into. Now I have a section in my talk, which I'm not going to give, on the work that we do in enforcement. And I'm not going to uh, go into some details on non-bank supervision. We supervise lots more than banks, which is, uh, you say, well, I hope you do, because you have this very big building that you're moving into. There's a list of all the, all the regulated financial firms in Ireland, um, firms and funds is almost 10,000 of them in that list. So it's a lot. And some of the regulations are highly complex. You have a large number, where was it? I said somewhere here I've said that you can't count, you'd need both fingers and toes to count the number of new regulations brought in even by the EU alone, let alone the international ones and local ones. and. Uh, so this is, this is all national responsibility to supervise these things. The SSM has only taken away a few banks and left us with 10,000 other things to do. Advising the government is another function that remains important. Despite its operational independence from government, the central bank is part of the state's administrative apparatus. And one of its statutory goals is to provide economic analysis and comment. So what kind of economic advice is the bank providing to government at present? And what I'd say here is with the lead into the budget, of course, we're emphasizing the importance of avoiding the mistake in years gone by to assume as permanent revenue sources that are volatile and maybe temporary. And here's a chart I like to use. This is my last chart. I like to use this chart. I take, I take out corporation tax, capital gains tax, <coughs> and stamp duties. Stamp duties mainly, the bulk of them, on, on housing transactions. In the boom years, companies, <coughs> including property firms, builders, were making large profits, and therefore there was a large corporation profits tax income. Capital gains, there were huge capital gains going on in, in, in the property market <coughs> and in the equity markets. Stamp duties pouring in because of the property transactions. But look how dependent the Irish uh, budget was becoming on these tran effectively transitory taxes, or some of them were transitory. They grew from 1987, okay, that's a long time ago, 8% of the total budget tax revenue. And by the top of the boom, they were over 30%. And then, as soon as the bust came, they collapsed down to around 20%. Even though other tax revenues fell as well, so the, the fact that nobody took account of the uh, volatility of these and the fact that they wouldn't be there permanently allowed people to think that the budget was in much, much better shape than it actually was. And so we have another recent output surge and other sources of tax revenue uh, larger than, than usual. And they should not defect the government from continuing to rebuild the balance, financial balance sheet of the state. In the previous three years, the seal of approval from the Troika allowed the government to take a longer time to bring the deficit under control. <coughs> now financial markets, which are still a major determinant of Ireland's bank borrowing costs, 
will look closely at budgetary trends and the government will do well to convince them of its continued determination to adhere to the medium-term fiscal goals set out in EU law. So that advice, the central bank basically uh, meshes very, very well with the recommendations of the Fiscal Advisory Council. So, I've covered a lot of things, but there are other things that I haven't covered. Managing the wholesale payment system, printing banknotes, minting coins, processing the issue and recovery of those banknotes and coins, managing the provision of euro system liquidity, ensuring the good preparedness of the deposit guarantee scheme. So there was a credit union liquidated in West Cork there, and uh, the, the uh, depositors got paid within the week. National Resolution Mechanism for Credit Institutions, powering up the new Credit Information Register, which will help the banks make their judgments on loans, investing the central bank's portfolio of financial assets, uh, lots and lots of other things to do. But I thought I would just share with you that idea that we're not entirely irrelevant, and so maybe um, we will need lots of staff, a flow of new energetic-enabled staff, and maybe some of you guys will be there and I'll see you along the corridor and say, where did I see? person before.